Now we're going to move into this is that, the beginning of the great harvest. Put in the sickle, Joel 3.13. The beginning of the great harvest. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. I so want to bring some clarification because there has been many prophetic words over decades about what? In specific, about a billion soul harvest, especially of youth. But sometimes... Having been around these words for years, I find that there's a little bit of nebulousness about these words. Many people proclaim them. And in fact, there's multiple versions of these words. And that's okay because the prophetic is partial, it is progressive, and it is conditional. And so that is part of the reason why there are multiple versions of these words. But, folks, I was around in the beginning when these words were initially given. So I don't know these words secondhand and thirdhand or fourthhand. I know many of these words firsthand, as do some of my other friends in this auditorium tonight, of a billion soul harvest, especially of youth. Now, I want to also state something really clear. This word originates all the way back in 1983. Now, there was a whole lot less population at that time. We have a whole lot more population now. And so we see in part, we know in part, and even the best prophesy in part. So could it be that the originators of even those prophetic words at 1983 were only even seeing in part. So I am personally not letting that word, even as grand as it is, and, and even though I believe this word, I'm not letting it be my ceiling. So I am going, yes, let's aim for one billion but if that was the word in 1983, and then if our population has doubled since then, then why are we letting that be our ceiling? Why aren't we doing a doubling cube? And I'm going, well, praise God. Are, are you following me somewhere? Yeah. Because prophetic words are partial. They're progressive and they are conditional. So I am grateful for this word and I'm going to unpack this word because folks, there has been an enormous amount of confusion. Uh, uh, hmm. Can we be real? There has been a lot of confusion around these words and there has been a lot of like different versions of these words and that's okay because words morph. They do, because I even know from the person who originated this word how this word even changed over time with even this particular person. Mm, really? Does that mean that? <laughs> no, it's because words are partial, words are progressive. And words are conditional. But let's move. So what I'm saying is, yeah, let's believe for one billion, and I'm going to unpack it. But why are we limiting in the great harvest for one billion? Why not three? Okay. I hope you're getting my point. Now, one billion soul harvest, especially of youth. But as some of my friends here 
know, even perhaps better than I, but I've done a lot of research on these words, that in 1983, there were three strategic prophetic signs were predicted in 1983 by seer prophet Bob Jones. Three signs of the times. One, in 1983, this very peculiar man, and I was here in Belmont Church with him, ministered here with him, came from Nashville, ministered here with him. I was in downstairs and, and prophesied to Doug and Dabney Mann downstairs, right? Yes. So I do have a little bit of earned right history to even speak from this particular auditorium into this history even. But in 1983, having done research on these words, having talked to my friends, Walt and Julie Meyer that are sitting here tonight, having listened to multiple, watched multiple videos on prophetic history, having listened as well to a history that was recently done by Wesley Campbell with Mike Bickle and on and on and on, three signs of the times. That in 1983, this unusual, I call it parabolic seer prophet Bob Jones stated, listen, in 1983, he said these three things. One, abortion would be perfected and made available by a pill. And when he said that in 1983, Mike Bickle turned to him and said, Bob? Do you even know what an abortion is? <laughs> Two, that homosexual marriage in 1983, he said, would be legalized and openly promoted in the United States. Number three, he said something else and very peculiar. That would be three signs that would come to pass as signs of the beginning of the billion soul harvest, especially of youth. He said, workers in, or laborers in rice fields in Asia, and he said particularly in China, workers in rice fields in Asia would be watching 24-7 worship and prayer on unplugged television sets on their wrist. Did you hear that? Unplugged television sets on their wrist is what he said. Because, now, how in the world are you going to explain a smartwatch when technology of such did not exist? And by, it is known, Bob Jones predicted that in 19... Un, that rice... Fields in laborers in rice fields would be watching 24-7, 365, listen to this, worship and prayer. Not just only prayer, worship and prayer on unplugged television sets on their wrist. Huh? Now, you would have rebuked that and said, that's a false prophecy and that's a false prophet but the technology didn't even exist because some words take time now are th are there fulfillments to those three words one now i had to do research because i was tired of this like oh like fuzziness I've been tired of this, like, well, when does the, this timeline, when does it actually really begin? When can we draw a demarcation in the sand, or however you want to say it, that we, we, we say, now it begins? So, listen to this. Are there fulfillments? One, Planned Parenthood 
just announced recently that the abortion pill is available to order without doctors or parents' consent to use at home. I got that as a direct quote off of Planned Parenthood's site. Now, I don't have the date on it. I believe it's like November of this, of, uh, this last year. Planned Parenthood just announced the abortion pill is available without, and that I don't know if I got the without in there. Yes, it is. Without a doctor's or parent's consent at home by mail order. Did you know that? Number two. On tw- Listen to this. On 12 13 22. The 117th U.S. Congress repealed the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, and passed the Respect of Marriage Act signed by President Joseph Biden. Well, what's that got to do with these prophecies? It officially draws the line in the sand. Because the first word was that the abortion pill would be perfected. Well, that's been perfected for a long time, but would be made readily available. Well, it has now been made readily available by mail. Second, by in last December, the 117th U.S. Congress on 1213 of 2022. The 117th U.S. Congress repealed legally the Defense of Marriage Act and passed the Respect of Marriage Act that is in effect in every state and every territory of the United States of America. That I don't have to explain what that means, see. That you know what that does? it does exactly the fulfillment of the previous slide, the three signs. Two, homosexual marriage will be legalized and openly promoted. So now I can actually say that these signs have been fulfilled. Now those are negative signs, but we can say now Are there fulfillments? Number one, yes. Without anything being nebulous. Number two, yes. Without anything being nebulous. Number three, smart watches are available with video capacities that can view 24-7, 365 worship and prayer from many locations. Now, I don't need to go into all the specifics, but let's just say I hop in Kansas City with their relationship with a certain television network is actually available to view anywhere in the world. Hello, and you can watch it anywhere in the world. So guess what? All three of those prophetic words from 1983, there is a clear fulfillment of all three of those peculiar words from 1983 without any fuzziness, without anything at all. They are officially fulfilled. So what does that mean? That means we can uh, uh, now, some of those words aren't good, aren't, aren't, aren't great words, but the issue is when there's darkness, that's when there's great light can shine. It's the backdrop of darkness, according to Isaiah 60, is when the light shall shine. So we can officially say that according to at least those prophetic words, They have officially been fulfilled. Therefore, we can exercise faith and we can say 
the beginning of the great harvest has now begun. Are there fulfillments? Number one, yes. Number two, yes. Number three, yes. Next. Bob Jones and the Kansas City Chiefs. No, I'm not here to exalt a personality. But these words are important. Bob Jones told me at least 10 times, when the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, you will know that revival is about to come and that God is raising up his apostolic chiefs. Well, that's a little strange word, isn't it? Well, let's do a little investigation on that one then. Five times the Kansas City Chiefs have been involved in the Super Bowl. In 1967, in the first one, they lost to the Green Bay Packers. Well, that one, of course, doesn't count. In 19, do you think I've done a little bit of research for this presentation? In 1970, which is important, num the, number four, they won over the, the Minnesota Vikings. Number three, in 2020, in the Super Bowl number 54, they won over the San Francisco 49ers. The following year, Number four, in 2021, Super Bowl number 54, they lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But listen to this one, and you're going to need to watch this about what Bob Jones said. In 2023, in Super Bowl number 57, they won over the Philadelphia Eagles. The date of the last Super Bowl was when? 2-12-23. What did Bob Jones say? And again, Bob Jones said, oop, I lose myself in my own slides. Bob Jones told me at least 10 times, when the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, you will know that the revival is about to come and God is raising up his apostolic chiefs. Well, they won in 2020, but, they, but we hit a worldwide pause. But what happened in 2023? In 2023, they won over the Philadelphia Eagles. The date of the last Super Bowl was 2-12-23. Go to the next slide. Asbury College Seminary and Revival. The Asbury College and Seminary, and I'm using generically then university, based not far away in Wilmore, Kentucky, has a history of revivals dating back to 1905, 1908, 1921, 1950, 1958, listen to this one, 1970, 1992, 2006, and as recent as 2023. The 1970 revival at Asbury had far-reaching cultural effects and remains central to the construction of Asbury's spiritual identity. The date, watch this, of the Asbury Revival broke out was February 8th, 2023. Hmm, that's pretty close to the 2023 win of the Chiefs Super Bowl. It was sparked by students spontaneously staying in Hughes Auditorium following a regularly scheduled chapel service. The news of the phenomenon quickly spread through social media. The revival was been compared to the similar revival at Asbury, notably our, that took place in 1970, which had far-reaching consequences in the growth of the Jesus People Movement. Participants were mainly members of Generation Z, 
It was attended by approximately 15,000 people each day. By the end, the revival brought 50 to 70,000 visitors to tiny Wilmore, Kentucky, representing more than 200 academic institutions and multiple countries. I was there twice. I sat on the back row. And it wasn't the thickest presence I've ever experienced. There was no major manifestations. It wasn't anything like that at all. You know those things, there were, there were two major things I was super impressed with. Super impressed with. Because I come from a Wesleyan background. That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to go there with all my heart in growing up. But part of my cross in growing up is that when I graduated from college with a degree in social work, and I was the first in my university to design my own internship in social work, where I lived in a bathroom with no air conditioning among the poor. I was the only white guy with 60% African American, 30% Hispanic, and maybe 10% Caucasian. Maybe 10%. And I was the first in my university to ever design my own internship in social work. And I lived in a sweltering bathroom. And I loved every minute of it. And that's part of my origins that a lot of people don't know anything about. My origins in ministry, they're not pulpiteering. My origins in ministry are among the poor. I had a free ride scholarship to Scarab University right here. And I turned it down. I don't know why I did, but I did. In social work, masters in social work, I had all kinds of things offered to me. I wanted to go to Asbury so bad, but the Lord challenged me to give up credentials before men. And that was a part of my cross, was to give up credentials before men. And that wasn't easy for me, because I was a little scholarly. And I gave up credentials before men. And I went into the Jesus People Movement. And I did all night prayer meetings. And I read a tract by Derek Prince expelling demons, and I did it the next day. <laughs> and I kind of wore, and I kind of grew my hair out long, sort of. I tried, and I had a mullet, <laughs> and I, and I was this straight little skinny kid from. A <laughs> a town, two hundred fifty-nine people, that knew nobody. And I, and I sewed braid on through the bottom of my jeans to try to, like, be a Jesus freak, <laughs> you know? And I, and I bought my own flannel shirts, you know, 
to try to like look like I was one of them, you know? I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. And I was a scholar. I had five scholarships when I graduated from high school to go to whatever university I wanted to go to. And I turned them all down. He's up for one. And then I didn't care anymore. Because I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I became a Jesus nut. <laughs> because I thought I was going to go into biology research and become the head biology research person for NASA and all that. And I was torn between music, which I still would like to do at 70 years old. And I still want to do. <laughs> I still want to do. And I am doing, by the way. And I am doing. And, 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 I, and I was torn between those two worlds. And, and then I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And none of it mattered to me anymore at all. None of it mattered at all. And I became a Jesus nut. And I was pegged to follow in my Uncle Arnold's footsteps, who was in full-time vocational Methodist ministry for 64 years. But the Lord, my part of my cross was to give up credentials before men. And so I couldn't go to Asbury Seminary, and I wanted to. But you know something that happened eventually later, and this is not in my notes, was it the Lord told me that when the Toronto outpouring happened that Randy Clark was going to go to uh, uh, Asbury and minister. And I was in Kansas City and, and all that. And so I would call St. Louis to Randy Clark's office. And I would say, Yo, Randy's going to be in Wilmore and I'm supposed to be there. And they would look at his itinerary and they would say, well, he's not. And I said, well, he's going to be. And they said, well, he's not. And then I would call two weeks later and said, well, uh, well, when's Randy going to be in uh, Wilmore? I said, he's going to be there, and I'm supposed to be there. And I said, well, it's not he's on, he's not on, he's on, he's itinerary. And then, um, and, you know, a month later, I would call back again, which that's not my norm. I'm not an initiator. I'm a responder. And, um, and so, you know, and then, you know, about six weeks later, I called again or something like that, two months later, and I called his office again. And, and then they go, uh... Randy's going to be at the Wilmore College, and he's going to be, and I go, I told you, no one. <laughs> and so, and I said, I'm going to be there, and, and I wasn't even invited. <laughs> and uh, I showed up, and sure enough, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened. Oh, and it's not on the list. <laughs> and it was extreme. And so Randy did the night meetings, and he turned the morning meetings over to me. And we prayed till, for people till 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Signs, wonders. I got the deliverance ones. Because <laughs> I came from Derek Prince's background. And so, I, you know, I mean, it was, it was stunning. But the Lord told me that I was to be there because it would be the first time that Randy Clark was going to run into controversy. And I already knew about controversy because I was a part of the Kansas City Prophets and we had run into international controversy and that I was supposed to be there with Randy because he was going to hit controversy and I was supposed to be there by his side. And sure enough, controversy happened. And I was there to be able to help be a coach for him when he hit controversy for his first time. And then the whole thing shut down. Do you know one of the things behind the scenes that when I went to Asbury the second time for the 200th anniversary of the Collegiate Day of Prayer, do you know one of the things that happened? A man came up to me, and of course I used to have hair. And this man came up to me, and he goes, uh, I know who you are. And I'm doing Clark Kent, not Superman. I'm incognito. I mean, I have no special seat. I have no special invite. I'm just another person there. And 
this man comes up to me and he goes, do you realize that it is the exact date that the meetings were shut down and you were the last speaker? And it was, I can't remember what he said, like it's like 20 years to the date and you were the last person. And he said, and I want to ask you to forgive us because we shut those meetings down. And, 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 and I was like, this is a God appointment thing, folks. And he said, and I want to ask you to forgive us because this man was a person in authority. And he said, and I want to honor you right now. And only God can do something like that. And because I wanted to be a part of an Asbury history and I gave that up and yet God etched my name into a part of a history. Well, that was a side thing, isn't it? So Asbury has a lot to do because there has been a recent outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has happened. And it's so important because it has become another hot spot as it was earlier and then out of it has spawned then whether it was Lee University, Samford University, and then it spawned over into secular universities. And I'm just so grateful. And two of the things that I noticed, and one of the things, again, that was just so, for me, was just delightful. The first time I was there, and I'm sitting on the back row, and this lady turns to me, and she goes, and you're supposed to introduce yourself. And, and I go, yeah, hi, I'm James. And this lady goes, oh, I'm, you know, Nicaretta or whatever, you know. And they go, oh, hi, and, and where are you from? She goes, oh, I'm from Norway. I go, oh, great. And she goes, yeah, I've read every single one of your books <laughs> from Norway, you know. It's, that's amazing. Now, but the two things I was stunned by at Asbury was this. They had people either raise their hand or stand that were 25 and under. Now, I don't remember the percent, but it was like 60% or more, 75%, that were 25 and under that were there. 75% were 25 and under. This was not an old folks gathering. And this was 75% were 25 and under. The second thing that I was stunned by that I've never seen anywhere, any time in my lifetime in any revival setting. They had a mic, and people would come up, and they would do this. They didn't prophesy. They didn't do, and I, and I love the popcorn stock type prayer where you do the short prayer, and they last for like 15, 20 seconds or so, you know. But here's what they did. A person would come up, whether they were six years old or 80 years old, and they would do the following. I have never seen it one time anywhere in my entire lifetime. I was shocked and stunned by this. A 21-year-old would come and read one scripture. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The moderator would then say, this is the word of God. And all the congregants would say together, and we believe it. And I'm like, I've never heard of such. And then another person would come, stand at the mic. They didn't say, and, 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 I, and, I, and this is my favorite verse. Or say, and I got this in a dream. And the next person would come and say, and maybe they're like uh, 70 years old. 
And they would say, uh, um, um, uh, go ye therefore, and, and, and you know, the, like the Great Commission. And the moderator would say, this is the word of God. And all the people would say, and we believe it. Now listen to this one. A seven-year-old comes to the mic and says, and I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And quotes from the book of Joel, the moderator says, this is the word of God. And everybody stands up and cheers and says, and we believe it. I have never seen anything like this anywhere in my lifetime. You know what it was? It was a revival of the word of God. It was a revival of holiness and conviction. But you know what it was? It was so transferable, I have never seen it anywhere in my lifetime. Anybody could do this. It was a revival of the word of God and there was no additives, none. Little boy, I will pour forth my spirit upon all flesh. The old will have dreams and the young will have visions and, and the moderator says, and this is the word of God and everybody is electrified and standard of things says, and we believe it. And the folks, that's revival. It's what we need. Do you know what that is? It's the missing commodity. It is a revival of the word of God. I have been so stunned by that. I've never seen it anywhere, ever. I've seen wild manifestations My newest book on revival breakthrough, I talk about the five classic characteristics of revival, but I have never in my life ever seen this demonstrated. Asbury College and revival. Three recent prophetic dreams that I have had. Hot spots, here we come. Holy Spirit is looking for places where there can be eruptions of his presence that can create unstoppable overflow. He is also searching for people just like you whom he can and wants to settle upon. I have a word for you. Hot spots, here we come. A second dream, the lightnings of God. I saw lightnings of God falling upon individual people. By the way, hot spots here we come is about corporate gatherings where I saw like the sizzles of God go. Shoo. And whether they were one second long or 10, the issue is you want to be there. Yeah. And it is atmospheric. These hot spots are atmospheric and, and the finger of God goes, Shoo. and you know what? You want to be there. You do not want to miss out on the of God. The finger of God is showing up again and it is atmospheric in nature. It is the of God. I've seen it in dreams and I declare it right now in the name of Jesus. It is a part of the beginning of the billion soul harvest. It is the beginning of the but that one is about the gathering of the assembly of people. The lightnings of God is different. I saw the lightnings of God falling upon and striking choice people who have been seeking purity in their hearts. This lightning presence of the Holy Spirit will be used to restore the fear of the Lord. And one brief, one brief lightning strike of God's power will change the trajectory of a person's life forever. 
Not only is there this sizzle that is coming in corporate gatherings, there are lightning strikes like what happened in my family. There are lightning strikes that are coming and the Lord told me that he is searching for people that carry the Psalm 24 longing of the Psalm 24 revival in their hearts. And the lightning bolts of God is going to strike them and change the trajectory of their lives. Number three, I had a dream of the sounds of heaven coming on earth. In this dream, I saw my earthly father and he was in a lead role in heaven's band. And everyone in this band of brothers, the B.O.B. Vaidin, were dressed in gold, but it was a sound that stood out. It was a symphony. It was the reverberations that was needed to create the revival breakthrough. It was first originated in heaven, but it must be echoed into the earth realm by God's band of brothers and sisters, not in competition, but walking together, who make up the caring family of God. Uh, listen, I could talk for an hour on each one of these points. Moving on. An assignment from heaven Ancient demonic gateways, though, must be closed. And here are two of them. The Leviathan spirit. I was saw in a dream. I was wakened up by the audible voice of the Lord. The Leviathan spirit. Don't get caught up in the war of words. And the external audible voice of the Lord came in my bedroom and said this. You must be careful not to get caught up in the war of words. Did you know that there is a war? Yeah. But part of the war that's being waged is a war of words. And I have been warned not to get caught up in the war of words. And this one is trippy, folks. It's trippy. Moving on the demonic spirit of offense. My dearest friend, Patricia King, there is a spirit of offense that has been loosed in the earth. This is not a low level type of spirit. It is a high level. God is working in the hearts and minds of believers to be unoffendable. <laughs> Moving on. Listen, every one of these points I literally could spend an hour with you, half hour with you on developing. But I have some very important things to get to. Here we are. Global Esther moment. Esther 4.14. For if you remain completely silent, and here's where we are. You see, we have had prophetic words, many of us that we know, as I have already quoted, for a generation. We are now at that Jordan to cross over into the fulfillment of those words. But are there any conditions that need to be met in order that we could be inheritors of those words? Are there? A global Esther moment. Esther 4.14 says, For if you remain completely silent this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But if you and your father's house, and you and your father's house will perish, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So there's a cost. Will you die to yourself? Will you lose your life? I'll give you some background. <laughs> Long time ago, <laughs> a lot of this is written up in my book, The Mystery of Israel in the Middle East. 
I was ministering in Hanover, Germany. And I was given a dream about the conference. First night, I would speak. I guess it went fine. <laughs> I don't really remember the first night. The second night, I would be asked to speak, which is not the norm. The norm is not that a primary speaker ministers two nights in a row. And I know I need to watch the clock, I know. Now listen, though, this is very, this is, I'm, I'm getting to some real, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to drive the truck home. And this is really important now. Because everything that has proceeded is now going to be important. And you're wondering, why in the world do I have these props up here on this stage? <laughs> so I was in Hanover, Germany, and I have this dream. But I don't tell anybody about the dream that I have that on the, about the conference. And the second night, I will be asked to speak. But nobody's going to speak because the manifest glory or presence of God is going to roll in and no one will be able to minister. But I tell no one about it. Sure enough, I speak on the first night. And I guess it went fine. But I was asked to speak the second night. I had just released a book that that time was called Father Forgive Us, that today is called Intercession, the Power and the Passion to Shape History. It was on what is called identificational repentance. Today, I've changed the terminology. I call it ambassadorial intercession. Now, so, first night, it was fine. Second night. I'm asked to speak. I tell no one about my dream. Presence of God rolls in. Hmm. Hey, Julie, could you or someone come to the keyboard? Someone, please. I'm very atmospheric oriented. And the presence of God started to come in just like the dream showed. People started getting on their face from the back. Roll in from the back to the front. And at least half, if not three-fourths of the people got on their face on the floor seeking God. I'm sitting on the front row because I'm supposed to be the speaker. I get out my Bible and the Holy Spirit directs me to read the book of Esther. It's the only time this has happened in my life, well, maybe three times, but he instructs me to read the book of Esther. I'm sitting on the front row. But the tangible manifest presence of God is all over me. And I now have an assignment. While that presence of God is so thick, I read the book of Esther under a tangible anointing but from a different lens, not about Hadassah, who becomes Esther, not about Artaxerxes or Vashti, not about Haman. I read it from the lens of Mordecai, Mordecai, from beginning to end. I sat there and the Holy Spirit interprets the book of Esther from beginning to end. Oh. From beginning to end. From the lens of Mordecai. And he starts talking to me. 
about how we would relive history and how the church in Germany, I was in Germany, did not take a stand. The Christians did not take a stand. And how a window of opportunity would open once again. And we would relive the book of Esther all over again. And God's desire would be that the Jewish people would be carried on the Gentiles' shoulders. And I'm reading the book of Esther from beginning to end under the anointing from the lens of Mordecai. I read it twice. I might have read it three times. This has never happened before. I would like for it to happen again. And he starts talking to me about my own life, about the future. Oh, and I remember when we moved to Antioch and we moved to someplace called Hunter's Run. And we walked out a lot of parables out of Jeremiah, the fishers and the hunters, and I don't have time to unfold all of this. And now we are now living in those days. And I was a part 30 years ago when an audacious young man or was it 40 years ago when an audacious young man named Mike Bickle called forth for a Joel's army fast from May 7th through May 28th in 1983 and I lived we lived in Warrensburg, Missouri, and I pastored Harvest Fellowship. And we did 21 nights of worship and prayer. And I was touched by an angel on one of those nights. And I knew that my future, that I, was, I had to give up everything I knew at that time to go attach myself to whatever purposes of God that was going to come forth with that group of people. And I did. Forty years later, and that changed, and, and went to a leaders meeting and met Bob Jones and Augustine Acala. And I started traveling with Bob Jones from that day forward. Forty years ago. Right now. And now, 40 years later, May 7th through May 28th, there's something called the Isaiah 2062 fast. And when I heard about it, and I did hear about it a little earlier on, I felt the same trumpet sound that I heard 40 years ago as when I was 30. And now I'm 70. And guess what? I'm willing to invest my life into it like I did when I was 30. Because that was the greatest trajectory of destiny that changed my life. But you know something? When we read Esther 4.14, sometimes we quote it wrong. We quote it like those are Esther's words. But they're not. 
those words do not originate with Esther. But we quote them as though they do. And yes, Esther said them, but no, those words do not originate with Esther. Because read Esther 4.13. Then Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. That you and your father's house will perish, but who knows whether you have come for the, to the kingdom for such a time as this. These are the words of Mordecai who was her coach, who was her tutor, who was her mentor, who was her cousin, who adopted her, who helped prepare her for her appointment before the king. It is time not only for the mama bears, it is the time for the Mordecais to come forth who are the equippers. And I'm going to flat out tell you something. I'm alive for such a time as this. For the fulfillment of 40 years later, for a global Esther moment. So what time is it? What time is it? It's the time... We could, but help. I'll just do it. It's the time of closing old doors. It's the time of closing some old doors. I know what I'm talking about right now, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Revelation 3, 7b. These things says he who is holy, who is true, who, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And we all want to go through the new, but before we go through the new, sometimes we have to let go of the familiar. I don't like it. It's freaking hard. Hi. It's not easy. But I decided, I was just on this Zoom the other day with Mike Bickle. <laughs> and we had the friendliest chat we have had, and I don't know how long. And we said, did you watch that Jesus Revolution movie? How many of you have seen the Jesus Revolution movie? And if you haven't, you need to go see it 10 times. And you need to take friends. And I said, did you, did, you, did you watch that short, the end of it? Where there's the Billy Graham talks. And he says, yeah, he said, I wept. And then he recited some personal stuff with me that he's never recited with me before, but I knew. And he says, yeah, I remember. You came to Colonial Presbyterian Church and I was maybe 17 and you were about 19 and we got on the same bus together and we rode to Dallas, Texas together on the same bus to go to Dallas, Texas, to the Cotton Bowl. And I said, yeah, and we sang Jesus songs all the way down there together. 
and I have some of Billy Graham's message memorized from the fifth night. And I said, yeah, I said, and you remember the fifth night? I said, and Billy Graham's message was on commitment. And I said, I know what I did on the fifth night. Do you? He says, yes. Now I'm paraphrasing, of course. I said, I dedicated my life to full-time Christian service at the Cotton Bowl in June in 1980, I guess it's in, in, in 19, what was it, 92? 72, thank you, thank you. And Mike Bickle goes, and so did I. And we had candles too, didn't we? And I said, yeah, and we sang, pass it on. And it was the most joyful, amazing conversation that we had. Because you know what? We both had the same defining moment at the same time in the Cotton Bowl at Expo 72 in 1972, where we stood to our feet and we said no to what could have been And in 1972, we went through a door into an unknown future. And there are many times in our lives that we close doors and we open doors and revelations 3, 7 says, these things I say to the holy who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and shuts doors and shuts and no one can open. And Revelations 4, 1 says, and after these things I look and behold, a door standing open in heaven. A lot of people have these keys. But there was a time where some person went around the country and they gave these keys to specific people. And they gave one to Lou Engle. They gave one to Dutch Sheets. And they gave one to me. And I don't know how many these keys were given around, were given away. But I was given this key. It's mine and you can't have it. And it's... What he opens, no one can shut. Isaiah 22, 22. With a star of David. And yet, I believe that we are at a door of the greatest harvest that the world has ever seen. But I think there's some conditions that have to be met. Well, I believe that the prophecies have been fulfilled. I think that they're partial. I think that they're progressive. And I think they're also conditional. And I think that according to the Bible, people can miss the day of their visitation. And some people can even hear words and miss being a part of what they have even prayed for. And even churches can and cities can. And as for me, I will not miss being a part of what I have waited prayed for and longed for for 40 years and if it means though none go with me which is not true which is not true
You know what it means? I have to change the name of my ministry. I don't know what all it means right now. But there is always a cost. And there is always faith. And there is always obedience. And I don't know what it looks like, but there's three keys to revival doors. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8. Three tools of divine cooperation. Three keys are used to open heavens, to open heavens, open minds and doors for revival breakthrough, prayer and fasting, hunger for God's manifest presence and prophetic revelations. I'm going back to where I started. Yes, this is that. Believing for the great harvest. How can we partner with the Holy Spirit for an unprecedented harvest of souls? As Jeremiah 33, 3 states, call upon me. And I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. What is the great harvest ultimately about? It is about God's great deep love for all those whom he has created. The great harvest is about his desire that no one should perish, but that everyone should have the opportunity to respond to the gospel of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's time that we believe for the greatest harvest in church history. Now is the time and we are the people. And let's lay hold of the prophetic promises and be believing believers. Amen and amen. Now,